As you can see, we have a Heart for the House brochures all around on our chairs. So please pick one up and prayerfully pray that, that Leon's um, designed these so amazingly. And um, once a year we do what we call Heart for the House. And the, the, the way God has uh, blessed us to even be in this space, be in this building, that we were able to purchase this building last year in August. And we borrowed money from the, uh, the Baptist Financial Services. And we also borrowed uh, around $2 million from our own people that we are uh, paying them an 8% interest per annum, but every month. And, um, and, we're, gonna, and we're, gonna, we're trusting God to pay them. We're going to be paying them back next year. So it was a two-year loan. And that's how we, together as a family, purchased this building, this space. After been going as a church, we've been going for 33 years. So I'm just giving you a little bit of a quick snapshot of where we're at. And we've come through almost the first year. And in August, we would have done a whole year of paying the mortgage down, which, which um, is going to be amazing because we're, the mortgage will come down at least by $15,000 a month down repayments. That's amazing. So um, God has been, been good. You guys have been so generous. Why don't you give yourselves a proper hand clap? And because it's your generosity, it's our generosity as a church family that we're able to get a venue like this. It's just a tool. The building is a tool to get the job done, to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to disciple our city, our nation and the nations of the world. And um, you can have a, a little read of this. Pray with your husband, wife and, you know, if you're married, pray together, obviously, and seek God. What you are able to do in faith, ask God what, what he's asking you to, to contribute. This might sound like a, a big, a, a big amount, like $1 million is our goal for this heart for the house in this next few months. <coughs> Excuse me. But when we all carry the weight and we all carry the responsibility, we all, we, we all say, Lord, I'll do my little bit. And even if your little bit is a two might uh, example, you know, where the widow with the two might, she gave all that she gave. She, she, everything she had, she gave. And Jesus said she gave more than everyone else that gave big amounts. So it's not the amount you give, it's just being obedient to the voice of God. And um, even those that maybe were watching, you've been with us and you've been watching, and even online you've been watching and watching, I wonder if these guys are going to close the deal. I wonder if they're going to pull it off. I wonder, I wonder if, well, it's happened, and thank God by His grace, he, He's the one to give us an enablement, and now we've closed the deal, but now we're, we're dreaming for our building paid off because of what we can do with the gospel, discipling the nations. And as you know, we already planted a location in Blacktown. We're going to plant another one in the Shire at the end of the year. And so we're, we're trusting God. God's going to multiply and we're going to plant many churches around Sydney and Australia and, and, and beyond. <laughs> so as a family, consider prayerfully. And, and we're going to receive this offering on the 16th of June, which is two weeks away. And um, obviously you can give... As soon as you want to, you don't have to wait for the 16th. If you, if you feel like we already know, we, we already prayed about what we're going to give and what we are able to give, and we want to do that now. So you can do that online. Um, and also you can do um, after the 16th, of course. Not a deadline where, oh, after the 16th I can't give. You can give at any point. We're just doing it as a family, for landing it on one day. And um, some people have chosen they can give um, monthly. And some have done that throughout the whole year. And that's... That's, uh, if that's what works for your budget, if you're able to give a certain amount above your tithes and offering, you think, I'm going to give towards the building. Make sure you write down building. And if you do need tax deductible giving, which means, because normal giving to the church isn't tax deductible, but we do have a DGR account for this building. That we got that from the tax department three years ago. And so you, you, you let us know, I would like a tax deductible donation. And then we will give you the receipt with the receipt number of the DGR. So you can submit that to the government. And that means you don't get, you don't get tax on that amount you give. Does that make sense? That's, all that, that's what that means. So if you gave a big amount, you won't get taxed on that. And then you'll get taxed on the rem remaining income of your year. So sometimes people have to, you know, I, I know, I know um, people that are so wealthy, they said that the, tax, I mean, the accountant told me I have to buy a, a car or else the government will get the tax money. It's a good problem to have because you might as well buy yourself a, a, an expensive car because you need to use it for your business. But if you don't, you're going to get taxed that amount. So um, some people can do that. 
and you get tax deductible donation, okay? And so let's, let's prayerfully take this on. I, I really, we're believing for a miracle, you know? A million dollars, it, it might stretch some of our faith, and it stretches my faith for this one. We, we, we needed a million, $1.6 million around that last year to close the deal. Actually, more because of the $2 million that we loaned. But just to close it, we, we raised at that period, if I remember right, $1.3 or $1.4 million in our giving, in our togetherness. That's pretty amazing. You know, like, that's how we close the deal, right? So, so in our faith, we go, oh, that sounds like a lot, but God can do it. We're, we're asking to come and have faith with us. Come and believe with us. And if you say, Lee, I don't have anything to give, my encouragement is, if that's you, there might be a short, small amount of people that, that you know, little, maybe they think, I've got nothing else in my budget to be able to give, then release your faith and say, God, give me a seed so I can give. You'll be surprised what God will do. If you've got that willingness to, to give, the Bible does say he provides seed to the sower. So you have to commit to being a sower. I love the way, the wording sowing, not giving. Because if I give, it sounds like it'll never come back. But if I sow a seed, it produces a tree with fruit in it and many seeds come back. Multiplies. That's the kingdom. Amen? So ask God. Say, Father, I, I'm a, I believe in God to give this amount. Can you bring that to me? If you happen to have nothing in your budget. But the reality is, it's a, in most of our cases, it's a priority shift. Pro, changing our, sh- our priorities in our hearts that we do have the finances. but say, Lord, I actually want to seek first your kingdom. And I want to see your kingdom be established on the earth. Amen. And I'm going I'm to speak on the heart of being um, generous to God and his kingdom and his purposes. Right. But I'm going to talk on the tithe and the offering. But I want to speak on the why God instituted and why God has, has ratified the tithe in the law. Because it didn't start in the law. Okay? It started way back in Abraham. But also before Abraham, guess what? It was even in Cain and Abel. If you study what actually happened with Cain and Abel's offering... They were the first two sons that chose to give an offering to the Lord. If you read it in its context, look up the Hebrew words. After a period of time, first the Bible says Cain was a man of the you know, fields, like planting seeds. I feel what they call it, agricultural. But Abel was taking care of sheep and he was taking care of animals. Then it says, in the course of time, that's, you look that up, it means after a long period of time, in other words, almost like the attitude was, it wasn't his first fruits. It wasn't Cain's first fruit. He, he took care of his own needs. Everything. After a long period of time, he took over what's left from the fruit of the land, and he took it and gave it to an offering from the Lord, gave it to the Lord. And uh, Abel, the Bible says, he took the firstling, the firstborn animals. Why did God receive Abel's offering and rejected Cain's? It's because Abel gave God his first. It was like in his heart it reflected the honour that he had to God. He says, God, I give this to you first. Not when I, whatever's left over. I mean, that's, that's the spirit of the tithe. That's the heart behind the tithe. Did you know, and that's, that's, you can study that for yourself if you don't, if you read it from its surface, you won't even understand it. But if you look it up and look up the meaning, ah, he gave the first fruit. That was his first to God. Then he lived off the rest. So I want to show you the word tithe means test. In the Bible, we're going to, I'll show you all the scriptures. I believe the word tithe means 10%, the first thing we have to say. So I should have said that first. The word tithe means 10th. But the... But the the, what God in, put in place, I believe it tests our heart. Now, you, you think, how, do you, how do you know that, Leo? Well, how many um, plagues were in the Bible? The word tenth, you can look it up in the Bible when you read all these examples. I'm going to show you. You can see, ah, that's what God is using. The number 10 represents testing. That's what I was trying to say. But how many plagues were there in Egypt when God was testing the heart of Pharaoh? How many plagues? 10. How many commandments did God give mankind to test our obedience? 10. You you guys are pretty good. You're catching on really smart. Um, The Bible says in Numbers 14 verse 22, Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me 
to test. God's saying the children of Israel put me to test these 10 times and have not listened to my voice. So he's saying these children of Israel have tested me out here in the wilderness 10 times. Test 10 times. And then in Genesis 31 verse 41, um, Jacob's father-in-law changed Jacob's wages 10 times. It's testing Jacob's heart. And um, Daniel chapter 1, 12, this is what the Bible says, please test your servants for 10 days. This is what Daniel said to the, to the guys who was, he was under authority. Test um, your servants, the children of the Jewish people that they took into captivity. Test us 10 times, the 10 days, and let us be given vegetables to eat rather than, and water and drink, and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and appearance of the youth who are eating the king's choice foods and deal with your servants according to what you see. Please test your servants with 10 days. The tithe is the 10th. And, and um, in, just interesting that um, Daniel is saying, test us 10 times. We'll eat vegetables. They'll eat your choice food, your, your, your people, but we'll eat vegetables. You'll see that our countenance will be better than theirs. It was a test, right? And he said 10 days. God, God gives us keys, secrets in the Bible to understand. Um, Malachi, sorry, no, it keeps going. One, two, it's gone back, but... Just give me just in case. It looks like it's dying. All right. Um, the book of Revelations. No, sorry. How many virgins were there in the parable that Jesus spoke? I'll give you a clue. There was five virgins with oil um, in their lamps and five virgins without oil. How many? Ten. ten. You guys are really smart. Um, in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10, in the book of Revelations, in your Bible, the devil will, I read it, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Testing for 10 days. Pressure for 10 days. Be faithful unto the death and I'll give you the crown of life. So it's just very, very clear in the Bible, not one or two scriptures. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a word should be established. It's quite clear that 10, the number 10, represents testing. And then in Malachi... Bring the, let me read Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this. I mean, bring the whole tenth into my storehouse. And then God himself says, test me in this, says the Lord of hosts. I will not open for your windows of heaven, pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Everyone say overflows. Not just a blessing, but until it overflows. This is God's heart. Right and if and, and test me he says if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows then I'll rebuke God says himself I will rebuke the devourer for you so that he will not destroy the fruits of the ground nor will your vine in the fields cast its grapes says the Lord of hosts all the nations will call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land says the Lord of hosts I mean you read it in its context he, I don't want to get stuck in here but he, he says but your words are against me God says, but the problem is your words speak against me. Because you say, oh, it's not, uh, the, the, uh, the unrighteous, they're getting blessed. And uh, we're doing all this faithfulness and God's not blessing us. Your words work against me. Sometimes we, we've got to be careful of our words, our confession, our, what's coming out of our heart. Because this has to be connected to faith. You don't legalistically tithe and just think, oh, God's going to do, do it magically. It doesn't work that way. Amen? It's not, it is not a magical cure for all your finances. It's just one part of our hearts trusting that, Lord, we're going to put this, we're going to bring this to you first. We're going to give you the first. We're going to give you the best. Amen? And I'll, I just want to uh, um, look at something. This is the only, way in, the only place in all of the whole Bible that God tells us to test him with a tenth. It's the only place. You can't test God. But he says, if you, if you don't believe, my, just test me, God says. And I mean, we just got to believe his word. Um, I, I just thought to myself, you know, if you're unsure about this tithing thing, then take God's challenge and test him in it. I dare you, triple dare you, put it into place. But don't do it once and go, let me see what the blessing is. Do it for a whole year. You'll see God come through. You'll see God come through in a powerful way. He always does. I, I, I'm hearing a lot of testimonies in the life of our church with finances because people are giving towards the building and towards God's kingdom. 
This, is, this came in from Catherine. You can speak to her. She's from the West. She, she comes to our meetings here, Open Heaven, and, and um, she was here in the Cheyenne. When Cheyenne was here, remember, he, he made a decision on the last night that, you know, we were going to, as a church, take up an offering to give it to him. But he said, no, take up an offering and give it towards the building. Do you remember that? Yeah. He spoke about the building and so on. So this is, um, Catherine says, at Cheyenne's meeting at GGC Leichhardt, uh, and he was testifying of, the, of he and his wife tithing 71% of their income. That's where they've got to. It started at 10% when they first got saved. But as they grew in, in you know, financial strength, they, they gave more and more and more and more and they sowed more and so on. Up to now, 71% of their income. Isn't that amazing? Giving, living off 30%, giving 70% away for his kingdom's sake. As I was in worship at the beginning of uh, his final service, I asked God, how much, Lord? Tell me how much you want me to tithe and I will do it. I heard, remember the word tithe means 10, but anyway, she's just saying, I want to give. And um, how much, Lord? Tell me how much you want me to tithe and I will do it. I heard 50 and at first I was shocked because I had never given that much before. However, I was determined to obey God and give with the right heart. So this is not a 50% every week. It's just as she, in her heart, she's going to explain. Uh, after this meeting, I was praying at home and I felt God say that he wanted me to give 50% of the first income of my new job as my tithe. As a one-off, 50%, because the tithe is 10 Sure enough, my first pay for my new job came and I tied 50% of that wage. I've always known that God always blesses and multiplies what we will give, especially when, our, especially when we are doing it with the right heart. Absolutely right. And she's a tither herself, so she's already got the right foundation in place. Exactly one week later, after tithing this amount, I received an immediate financial breakthrough and a lump sum payment of $6,652 from my previous employer, I wasn't expecting this. I had no idea that I was due to receive this, but God. This really encouraged me and showed me the power of the tithe and giving with the right heart in obedience unto him. And that's the key. With the right heart in obedience to him. We, we, we give generously. We know that it's a seed and it will come back. But that's not why we give. So we don't give because we want to receive. That would be a really selfish motive where God's looking down at his children. Wow, my children are learning to give because they want to receive. They're giving more because they want to receive more. Like God wants us to give in obedience to his voice and his word. Remember I was talking about, oh God, I want more of you. Well, his word says this. This is how you get more of him. His word says, submit yourself to him in this area of finances. Let, let me explain. Um, Luke 16, verse 10 to 12. I really want to go through these scriptures. To me, they're foundational. And I want us to see that God's looking at our hearts. So he's, he's more concerned about the heart, not the money. He wants us to catch his heart. You following? So in Luke 16, verse 10, it says, He who is faithful in very little thing is also faithful in the much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is also unrighteous in much. If you're faithful in the little, you is faithful over much. Not one day into the future you will. You've got to master being faithful with what God has given you now. Does that make sense? I remember when I first became a Christian, I got saved. I gave my life to the Lord. I was a fashion designer. I was, I was um, you know, uh, just completely undone with His goodness. I got a revelation of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And I remember everyone was talking about this tithing word. I didn't even know what it meant. I said, what is tithing? And they're just, you know, just a normal conversation with other believers. I was saying, oh, we give 10% of our income. Okay. Is that what the Bible said? Yeah, that's what the Bible said. Okay. Had no problem, no question, no attitude. Just, oh, great. That's what we do. Because God had my heart. He's got my heart. He's got everything. It wasn't a question for me. And from that day, that was in 1987. Some of you weren't even born yet. And 1987, I, was tw I got saved at 19. And I, we've, we, we, since I was a Christian and uh, since we married, never ever, as far as we remember, have forgotten to tithe. We just always do. And we don't even go for a hard time. Oh, we're going for a hard time. Let's not tithe. We actually tithe first. And God has extremely blessed us and our family. Extremely. And it's not through the church, just so you know, only. God has blessed us, but Christine's mother and father has blessed us for years. They run a very, very successful cleaning business in Melbourne. Very successful. And, and I thought, driving here, I thought, every single car we drive, we, ne we didn't pay for. Remember, we've got three cars. We did not pay for those cars. Josiah didn't pay for his car. Leon didn't pay for his car. <laughs> 
Ethan didn't pay for his car. It was a brand new bought by our parent, our grandpa, our, well, their grandparents, our parents. That's a blessing. We weren't, we weren't, we weren't thinking, no, oh, that's going to happen. We never clue that was going to happen. They weren't in a place where they were financially strong when we first started. I'm talking about Christine's mum and dad. And that's just one aspect. But God is continually taking care of us. And the way we run the finances of the church is the same way. The tithe and offering that come, everything we receive as income, we tithe and offer from the top. We don't pay all the bills first and all the rent and all the mortgage and all that and all the electricity and then tithe. No, you, you usually won't have anything left over. We give God first. Amen. I believe this. I really believe this. We live this and we've seen great fruitfulness. We just had a meeting with our financial guys that, that we employ that runs our books, like an, is an accountant, works for a big firm, and the, the Baptist Financial Services. He was pretty much saying, you've got a big amount here that you tithe and offer to the nations and to preach gospel and all that. And like, you know, it's a fair bit of amount. And, he goes, and if you ever struggle, you can not tithe and then give, so you can pay the mortgage. So no, we'll never do that. It's not even a question, not even a, not even a, a temptation. And that, just shut it down. It'll, it'll ne- that will never happen. Because we always tithe first. Even our financial guys who are believers told us we should do that. No way. But I'm just, that's, that's looking into our hearts how we've led the church for 33 years, and why has God brought us into this place. I believe it's because of the generosity of him giving that revelation to us. Amen? Um, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, this is the words of Jesus, not my words. Jesus said, if you and I have not been faithful with unrighteous wealth, what do you think unrighteous wealth is? It's money. It's the wealth of this world, right? Right? Who will trust you, the true riches, to you? What's the true riches? It's the presence of God, the anointing, the glory. It's everything to do with the kingdom. That's the true riches. But God is testing our hearts. And I, 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 please hear my heart. I'm, I'm speaking to faithful, faithful, faithful people. You guys have been so faithful, so generous. But I have to speak this because there's always new people coming. And they might not have been taught this. They might not have understood this. And look what it says. Um, who's going to give you true riches? Then it also says, if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? There's something about your hard attitude. If you can't take care of what someone else belong, what it belongs to someone else, that's true at work. That's true when you're renting a home. It's true if you're anything. Oh, it's not my home. I don't care. And you, you, you treat it really bad. No, treat it well like it was yours. And not to mention... God has uh, God owns everything. Yes, I do believe that God. The Bible says very clearly that He's given the earth to the to, to the the children of men. It's in the Bible that God owns the heavens and the earth, but the men to the sorry, but the earth uh, uh, He is given to the children of men. In your Bible, the meek shall inherit the earth. We're joint heirs with Christ. Joint, you know, all that, heirs with God. We will inherit everything in the earth. At the moment, we've got to be very, very good stewards. So, whatever God gives you, whatever He trusts you with, technically, it's all His. Do you agree? And he says, 10% of it, start with 10%. Just start with 10%. It doesn't stay there. You start with 10%. Let it go into my kingdom. Right? As a pastor, when I first became a Christian, as a Christian, as I, three years later, I started a church and I was a pastor. I'm a baby pastor. Why was I a baby pastor? I had no training, no formal training, no Bible college, no nothing. So Lord, eventually God said to me, Leah, you need to teach people to tithe. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I fought God for about two months. Come, Leo, you need to start teaching. People, people were getting saved. People were joining the church from other churches. But mainly people were getting saved. They knew nothing from the Bible. 80 90%, 80% of those days were getting saved in our church. So the very few people were joining us from other church. But one lady who got saved in our church, um, the Lord said to me, Leo, you need to teach on tithing. I said, but Lord, I don't want them to think I wanna, I'm t- doing this for money. I kept fighting and saying, no, no. Eventually, this lady comes to me. This is like a few months later. comes to me, Leah, guess what? What? Her name was Lisa Pentecost. She goes, uh, God, God spoke to me. God. She was so excited that God spoke to her. I said, really? What did God say? And she goes, oh, I was just talking to the Lord in, the, in my presence by myself, uh, so in, in the room by myself, in his presence, and I felt the Lord say to me, this is all that she heard, you have robbed me. And, I, and she said to me, I said to the Lord, what do you mean I've robbed you? Where have I robbed you? That's all she said. I said, oh, wow. I went to Malachi. Let her read it. She read it. It was a great open door for me to share to her about tithing and offering. And I did. 
I shared it to her. It was just God spoke to her and prepared her heart. And so I was able to share to her from the Bible. She got excited when she read Malachi because she thought, wow, God spoke to me. She was more excited that God spoke to her than having to tithe. Seriously, because she's, God's voice spoke to her. And that was God's way of confirming me being a young baby pastor. <laughs> and God is like that. He, he, I've just seen faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness where people bring tithe to him first. In Malachi, it, it goes on to say that if you do this, uh, you will be blessed. But if you don't do it, it says you are cursed with a curse because you robbed me. This is the problem with our New Testament thinking. Most of us go, oh, we're not under a curse. We cannot be under a curse because we are New Testament believers. I 100% agree with that. I'm the first one to say that I, I agree that, with that. And I'll show you what I mean. I, I, I was skipping two scriptures. Let me give them to you. Luke 16. I'm going to go back to that thought. Luke 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things that Jesus was speaking and were scoffing. That word means um, criticism. They were critical to Jesus. They were upset, they were, eh, scoffing. Why is he talking about money? Hopefully, you're not sitting there and anyone online going, ah, why is he talking about money? Because money is a very important thing in our life. We need to know how to manage it. We need to know how to steward it. We need to know how to grow it. We need to know, build, we need to know how to let money work for us. Instead of us, work for money. As long as you work for money, money will never work for you. God actually, the Bible says, there is a scripture in the parable, it put my, we should have put my money to work. Put, put it in the bank and get interest in, instead of putting it into the ground. So God wants us to put our money to work. If the church doesn't talk about money, then the world will. And the world will brainwash you. You're talking about brainwash. The world will teach you the wrong way and get us into debt. The Bible teaches us how to get out of debt. He, the Bible, God's Word, God Himself actually, this is in the Old Testament, but I believe it's absolutely true in the New Testament lifestyle, He actually wants you to be the lender, not the one that's in debt. Because He says the one that's in debt is a slave to the lender. So He wants you to want to give, to be, to, to be the one that lends to others, and not the one that borrows. That's in the Old Testament. Oh, that's the Old Testament. God doesn't, no, it's still true for you today. And, and, um, I'll show you what I mean by that, right? That's important. Now, what about this one? Um, first of all, if, you, if you're upset right now and think, oh, why? It, maybe, maybe your heart is a little bit too much on wealth. You can't love God and money. You've got to choose. The word there was you can't have two masters. He used the word kurios. That's actually Lord. You can't have two lords. Money can be a really bad lord, but a good servant. It's a bad master. Don't let money be your master. You'll be a slave to money, but it's a good servant to you. Does that make sense? All God wants to do is not love money. How do you love money? When you think money will give you security. When you think money will give you freedom. When you think money will give you safety. Money will give me happiness and peace. No, you can have millions of dollars in the bank and still worry yourself sick. Did you know that? A lot of people that are wealthy are still full of fear. Money is not your freedom. Jesus is. Amen. Amen? So it's important to shift our heart, shift our mindset, shift our attitude about this. And God can trust us. Okay? What about this one? Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. What's treasure? Treasure is what you value. What you value, that's what your heart will go after. So if you value that money will, will give me security, money will give me freedom, money will give me happiness, if you value that, guess what? Your heart will go after money. Where your heart is, I'm sorry, where your treasure is, what you value in life, this is what treasure means. What you value is where your heart will go after. Amen? You following? My question is not what, what is your treasure, more so where is your treasure? Because he's saying, let your treasure be in heaven. So it's okay to have things, don't let that be your treasure. So it's okay to be a millionaire, for example, and you're going to probably get persecuted for this, but I, I believe it's absolutely true. Don't let that, that's not your treasure. Your heart's not in the millions because your treasure is in heaven. 
And when God says to give, you give. And guess what? You'll get rewards in heaven. You will be rewarded for every little good thing you do for God. Every obedient, every time you obey God, you'll be rewarded in heaven. How do you know that, Leo? Jesus says, if you give a cup of water in the name of a disciple, truly, truly, I say to you, you will not lose your reward. You will be rewarded for it. And the Bible says, every good thing you do in your body, you will, you will receive a reward. We'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll receive uh, whatever we have done, good or bad, in our body. Even bad things. Why? Because they get consumed. They get wasted and you don't get rewarded for what you've done bad. But when you do good, you get rewarded for it. And Because it's not about going to heaven or not. You're already in heaven. You're already a citizen of heaven. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. It's a judgment of rewards. So this clearly tells me God wants to know where your treasure is. Don't let it be here on this earth. Okay? If you have lots of things and a big CEO, a wealthy person, then use that wealth. Paul spoke to Timothy and says, command those that are rich in this present world to be generous and give. So he had wealthy people in his church. And what did Paul say to him? Command them to be generous. So it's okay to have money. Actually, Old Testament people, I mean, we read scripture with they're full on about, about King David, who's wealthy as Solomon, who's wealthy as. He's got books that we read in the, in the Bible. Job, the richest man in the East, and we read about his life. He loved God. He had lots of money. Abraham was wealthy. Isaac was wealthy. Jacob, all of them were wealthy as. God hasn't got a problem with wealth. He has a problem when wealth has you. Does that make sense? God understands it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. Not money itself. Money will empower you to do what's inside your heart. Please receive that. So if you've got evil in your heart, it'll empower you to do evil. If you're a gambler and you get lots of money, you, you, you'll gamble more. If you're addicted to drugs and you get lots of money, you, you'll do more drugs. Money empowers you to do what's in your heart already. All right. Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to... Talk about this Old Testament and New Testament thing really quickly because people go, oh, but isn't tithing in the Old Testament or isn't tithing under the law? Is it, is it a requirement for us now? Well, let me, uh, first of all, that's an interesting question. To me, I think we should never ask that question. I don't know why we even ask it, to be honest, but people do ask it. I know that. It's like, to me, it's like saying, um, is a requirement as a believer now um, to, to pray? Well, you can't say this. Is it, is it a requirement for me as a believer uh, to pray so that, uh, uh, in order that I'm saved? I, I want to make sure I'm saved. Do, do I need to pray to, to be saved? Because that's really what people are asking. Do I need to tithe to be saved? Of course not. In the same way, technically, you, you, how much, there's nowhere in the Bible. The Bible's not written that way in the New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament can you find this is how many hours you need to pray so that you can be saved. It's not there. It's impossible for it to be there because that wouldn't be the right salvation teaching. None of that can save you. Jesus' blood saves you. True? What about this one? The Bible says, um, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. It's not a good thing to say, I don't need to go to church. I'm going I'm to be a Christian at home. I'll just be me and my holy four and that's it. It's not a good thing. It's actually not good. Do you hear me? Because we have to belong to the body. We have to belong in the body. We're family, we're community. We are the body of Christ. But would you ask the question, do I need to go to church? Is it a requirement as a Christian to go to church? Is it a, crime, a requirement as a Christian to go to church to be saved? You wouldn't ask that question. You shouldn't ask that question. Does it make sense? It's like saying, um, when I'm married, uh, is it a requirement for me to kiss my wife? <laughs> of course I want to kiss my wife. I'm going to do more than just kiss my wife. Thank you very much. And it's holy because God designed. He came up with the whole idea of making love and beautiful, beautiful sex within a marriage covenant of a man and a woman. He designed it. You're following me. But why would I ask, you know, do I have to, what, what, what do I have to do? When you start looking at it, it's a heart thing and not a requirement thing. To me... We're asking the wrong questions, if I can say it that way. There's a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament, lots of them about first fruit, firstborn, firstling, um, that bring the first to God. He actually said it very, very clearly. First fruits belong to God. Anything that comes out of any animal, the womb of an animal, the first one that's born, give that one sacrifice to God. But hang on, it might not have any more children, any more babies or whatever you call them, calves, if it's a 
cow and a sheep if it's a lamb. Like, it might not have any more. Take the first one. It belongs to God. You sacrifice. It's the honor thing to give him the first. Because it's not your tithe when you pay everything or whatever's left over. Oh, God understands I'm in the new covenant. I'll just give this amount. Now, hear my heart. It's the heart where we're putting God first. It's all over the Old Testament. I've got, I can show you scripture, which I know you surely know. Um, where do I put that one? This is all, I've got so many scriptures. Um, all right. Uh, that is found in. One is. Um, where do I put it? If you, all right. It's basically saying, it's in first, it's first Corinthians chapter 10, and it's basically, you can look it up, basically it says that all the things that happen in the Old Testament is for our learning and examples. Example is this word, topaz, and it actually means uh, die like a pattern. Oh, what happened to the Old Testament people? It's for our learning. And so we can grow and learn and look at what happened and see the will of God, see the call of God. It's for our learning. We can, it's a tapos, a, a die, a what do you call it, like a stamp? You know, when, when you stamp something, and that, that creates more of like a photocopy. That we look at the pattern. We can learn from the pattern, right? And so if you say the tithing is under the law, well, first of all, you're wrong because God ratified the heart of tithing because Abraham started it. Abraham taught Isaac. Isaac taught Jacob. Jacob had an encounter with God. I think it was Genesis 28. He had a powerful encounter with that angel. And, and when he had an encounter, that was, no, sorry, this one, when he, when he slept on the, the rock and the vision came and the angels came down from the ladders and went back up. And he goes, wow, this is no other, none other than the house of God, the Bethel. This is the house of God. This is where God meets earth. This is the gateway of heaven. And, and, and from there he says, Lord, if you're with me and you take care of me and you bless me, I will give you 10% of everything back to you. Now, he had an encounter and he responded with his heart, I want to put everything first to you. Now, where did he learn that? Isaac, his dad. Where did Isaac learn it? Abraham. Abraham's the father of our faith. He did it not because of the law. He did it out of his heart. You following? Yeah. Hebrews talks about Abraham doing it and giving the tithe to Melchizedek. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the, in the New Testament. And it, it goes on to say, um, you can check it out, it says, in those that he gave it to Melchizedek, a, a temporal and a mortal man, but, in, but now we give it to him who lives forever. Talk about the tithe. We give it to him who lives forever. And it also says, oh, by the way, Levi, who's the Levitical priesthood, who's supposed to receive the tithe, listen to what the New Testament teaching, supposed to receive the tithe, he actually... Um, tithed when he was in Abraham's loins. He wasn't even born yet. He's in his loins. And by being in Abraham's loins, when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, he's basically saying, Le Levi, who is the, the, the Levitical priesthood who's supposed to receive the tithe, he also tithed. Wow. New Testament. Matthew 23, verse 23. You know that one. Jesus pr pretty much said, you are hypocrites. You tithe the mint, the herb, the spices. <laughs> Just a little bit for God. This is mine, a little bit. I mean, you go down to the spices, but you forget the weightier matters of the law. Mercy, faith, and faithfulness, and love. Because you should have done this and not leave the other undone. Or you should have done the former and not leave the later undone. He's basically saying you should have done both. So Jesus knew Old Covenant. I believe Jesus would have tithed. Listen to this. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. I want to read it from... Um, 17. Are you, you, you with me? You know, it's important to listen to the Word of God and read the Word because I, I'm trying to teach you how to read the Word while I do this. While I read, I want you to pick up and learn the Spirit and the context of the Scripture. Now, the context here, Jesus is trying to say, listen to what He says. He says it in verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Well, hang on a second. I thought you would. I thought you came to abolish the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying, I haven't come to abolish it. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. Now explain, uh, let's read it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter of the stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now we're not talking about the little requirement. We're talking about the spirit of the law and the righteousness of the law. Right? 
Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps the teachers, uh, keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen to what he starts saying. He brings a whole argument. Jesus is basically saying, under me, under new covenant, under grace empowerment, grace enabling, is a higher standard than the old. Way higher. Can't even compare. Right? You have heard that the ancients, Old Testament, were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, this is higher, that everyone who is angry with his brother, just angry with his brother, shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you, good for nothing, putting others down, calling them names, you idiot, you stupid. There's a higher standard in the new covenant, right? Don't you agree? Shall be guilty before the supreme court, and whoever says... You fools shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and he says, deal with it before you, if you've got something wrong with your brother, deal with it before you give your offering. Anyway, let's read from um, verse 27. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. You heard that? Is that true? Under the new covenant, because we're under the new covenant, and to not commit adultery is under the old covenant. Does that mean I'm free from, the, from committing adultery? Am I allowed to now commit adultery because I'm under the grace of God and not under the law? No, you're supposed to fulfill the law. We're actually enabled now to fulfill the law. Where in, when, you, when you're spiritually dead under the old covenant, where you're spiritually dead, Holy Spirit came on men and women of God, but never came in them. In the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is no longer with us. Jesus said to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is with you, but he shall be in you. Holy Spirit now is in us because we were spiritually dead. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. So the Holy Spirit resurrected our dead spirit. Holy Spirit comes, lives in us. Guess what? In this new creation realities, I and you can live the Ten Commandments. In the old covenant, no one could keep the Ten Commandments. Not all of them. God knew, I'll give you the Ten Commandments, but in your spiritually dead state, you can never possibly keep every single Ten Commandments. That's to show us the knowledge of sin. That's to show us, to point us, it's a schoolmaster, to point us that we all need a Savior. We're all undone. We can't keep the Ten Commandments in our spiritually dead state. So Jesus sends a Savior. It was to open up our eyes to say we all need a Savior. You have to know you're drowning in your sin for you to want a Savior. That's what the purpose of the Ten Commandments were. But now that we're born again, spirit-filled, resurrected from the dead, Holy Spirit's in us, renewing our mind. Now we actually can keep all the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? I'm not free from the law. Like, do you have a wallet on you? Anyone have a wallet on you? Who's got a wallet? Give me, someone give me a wallet. Yeah, fine. Oh, you have, oh look, it's my own son. Give me a wallet. He must trust me. I'm free from the law. I'm going to steal his money. Actually, he's got no money. <laughs> it's all cards. <laughs> so I'll take his card and I'll ask him for his number. And I'm, under, I'm not under the law anymore. I'm free, to, I'm free from the law. I'm just going to steal his money. Is that right? Is that wrong? That's got to be wrong. We're using the wrong terminology and the wrong questions. So I'm not free to steal. I'm now empowered to fulfill the law. And if you read the words of Jesus and continue... In this chapter, I wanted to read the whole chapter. He basically says, you know, that, that uh, you have heard it said, you not, shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And he goes on to say, take your right eye out and all that. Obviously, he doesn't want you to physically take it out. He's saying, how important is your right eye? If it's causing you to sin, how important? You would never want to lose it. But that's how, des- that's how, that's how devastating sin is. In other words, stop. You've got to see the importance of what sin is doing to you. And then he goes on. He even says, um, uh, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorcement. But I say to you, higher standard. Everyone, every time he says, but I say, it was always a higher standard. And he said it a number of times. We're running out of time, but you can read it for yourself. I say to you, if you divorce your wife, except for unfaithfulness, except for, in other words, committing adultery, that you, you are committing adultery. But if your spouse or husband or wife were unfaithful, then you can put her away and divorce her. That's a higher standard of just divorcing for any reason. Everywhere that Jesus spoke, and he said it a number of times, even I like this one, 
But I, uh, again, you have heard it said in the ancients, in the Old Testament, we're told you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, uh, 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 either by heaven or for, for it is the front of God or by earth, for it is the footstool. Basically it says, for nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Higher standard. Anything other than this is evil. If I say something to you and I say yes, I don't have to say, I promise you by my mum's grave, or I promise you by this. I don't have to promise you anything. My yes is yes, my no is no. Higher standard than what they used to say in the Old Covenant. Make an oath by the throne of God. Don't even do that. Just say yes, be yes. Everything is higher standard. In the New Testament, this is in the book of Hebrews, is our, the Old Covenant was so, um, it uh, had found fault in it. Because it couldn't make the worshiper perfect under the old covenant sacrifices. We had to do it every year because it didn't make anyone perfect. But once and for all, Jesus gave his life as the Lamb of God, sacrifice to make every worshiper perfect and their sin conscious gone. Not covered for a year and then do it again. He did it once and for all. He even went, the Bible says, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with His own blood, the Son of the living God, His own blood. Jesus, after He resurrected, went to the throne of heaven and poured out His blood at the mercy seat in heaven, not the one made with hands, old covenant. There's a type and a shadow of the real one that's in heaven. He went to heaven Himself and poured out His blood. Higher standard. That was, the Old Testament had fault, found fault. It was obsolete. Now there's made room for a new, based on better promises. So my thoughts, or anyone that says it's Old Covenant, it's got to be consistent with the whole Bible. What I mean by consistent with your argument, if you think that's an Old Covenant requirement, and first of all, it was done by faith from Abraham. It wasn't just from the laws. But if they start that way, shouldn't we do way better? Shouldn't we have the attitude that, God, I want to start with 10% and I want to grow to give more and more and more and more until the day I come to heaven or the day I die. The attitude of the heart is I want to be obedient the old covenant um, the, the wisdom behind the tithe God explained clearly what to do with it and it was for the Levitical priesthood so they can devote themselves to the hands of the Lord the work of the Lord in the tabernacle so they're all the children of Israel this is the Bible I'm telling you straight out right you can look it up if you don't believe me but 12 um, tribes weren't, weren't there 11 of them got inheritance in the land so they can work the land and 11 tribes had to take 10% and give it to the Levitical priesthood. They weren't given any agricultural land as inheritance. It's in your Bible. They weren't allowed to work the land. Everyone else got land? This tribe didn't get land. Why? They're living off 110% of other people's 10%. 11 tribes giving 10% is more than 100%. So God took care of the Levitical priesthood that way so that there would be food in my house. What's food in the house? It's spiritual food. And you don't come here and tithe somewhere else. Right? Oh, I didn't know that. You don't come here and get fed the Word of God and, and everything and, and maybe tithe, you put your tithe to feeding the poor, compassion, world vision, amazing ministries. You don't give your tithe to feeding the poor. You give your tithe to the storehouse. And if you want to take care of the poor, which we should, it should be above your tithes and offering. True? Now, I remember I was a baby Christian. I was tempted. I was going to my church and I, I started getting fed by other ministers around the world. I loved what they were, they were feeding me, feeding me. I think, man, I'm getting more fed out of them. I was deceived. I was feeding, I was getting more fed from them. And I started thinking, maybe I should tithe to them. And the Lord said, Leah, why would you tithe to them when you're sowing your life here, your time, your effort, your, your gifts, your abilities, your, your relationships? You are doing your life in this church family. Why would you send your money there and do your life here? Okay, Lord, that makes sense. Like, because money's a part of me. Money's a part of you. you. You work eight hours a day, five days a week, 40 hours a week, whatever, or more, and you exchange it for money. It's a part of you. So you sow it where you are shepherded, pastored, cared for. You can't ring any of those international ministers when you're going for a hard time. Say, Lord, can you please come and visit me? I'm going for a hard time. You can't ring them if you're in hospital and say, can you come and pray for me? I can't imagine any of them will fly themselves over to pray for you even though you're their partner. It's not God's biblical pattern. There's a pattern in the Bible for a purpose and a reason. I'm convinced because I have seen it for 30 something years and I've seen testimony after testimony, people that are tithing where they are selling a house 
and they probably got like five to eight hundred thousand dollars way over the market value because they were tithers. Seen that time and time again, where God knows how to bring it to you His way. And uh, oh yeah, I'm, this is what I'm convinced of that God has instituted the pattern of this tithe, this heart to bring Him the first fruit and then give more. To, to seek, this is our way of seeking first the kingdom. It's, it's proven to God, I actually want to seek first your kingdom, your righteousness and fulfill your purpose on the earth, which is disciple the nations. It's empower, empowering the church family to do this. You're part of the church family. You know what we spend the tithe on and offering, according to the Bible? We spend it back on into the house of God. The first way is wages. Pastors that are on wages, it's me, Leon, John, Christine, Jade, Kieran, and Sal. Six people that are on a wage that they can dedicate their life fully to help shepherd you, care for you, spend time in the Word, in prayer, in fasting, to feed us the Word of God, to equip us to become priests in the marketplace everywhere, which we all are priests in the marketplace. Does it make sense? So what does God spend it on? He doesn't need money in heaven. You don't have to send it to Him. He's got gold streets. He spends it back on our spiritual well-being. He actually spends it back on us. That's why we are here right now because of the faithfulness of the many years of people bringing their tithes, giving their offerings, and, and we are blessed by this. Yeah, this is a very good point. And, and yeah, I was going to try to say that is, what, what do you tithe on? You tithe on everything. The Bible does say tithe on increase. If I received $100, I would tithe on it. A birthday money, tithe on it. Any inheritance, we've tithed on it. We've lived this. We can never ask you to do something that we wouldn't do. Kristen and I have lived this. My parents passed away. We received some inheritance from the sale of the, ha- sale, of, sale of the house. We tithed first before we did anything. And then we, yeah. Because we bring God the first. And this is what I was trying to say. If we all tithed and all gave every increase, we would have more than enough money to get the job done. And I'm convinced of that. I've seen it and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced because uh, it's, it's God's pattern. But in America, I trust in Australia it's different, but in America, 2% of the people in the church tithe. Two. Sad. I, I believe our church is very, very high up there. I trust it is. I don't know how high it is, but I reckon it's very high for the size church that we are and what we are doing. But every increase. And again, you can try. If you say, oh, Lord, if I won the lottery, I'd tithe. Not if you're not tithing with the $1,000 a week you're getting now. So it's harder when you get bigger amounts. Because you think, oh, what could I do with that? If God blessed you with millions and millions of dollars, you learn to tithe all in everything. Inheritance and everything. Put Him first. I'm convinced of that. And there is one last example. It's found in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, I think it's 28. Um, Second Chronicles. Basically, it was they all brought, it's in, you know, in your Bible. I put it. Second Chronicles, I think it's 28 or 29. 28 verse 22. No, that's wrong. That's Genesis. Yeah, Second Chronicles 31 verse 4 to 5. If you're writing it down, have a look. 2 Chronicles 31 verse 4 to 5 is when they all brought in the tithe for four or five months. It became heaped up. You remember that story where it was so heaped up and they said, what is this? This is the tithe of all the people bringing everything and there's more than enough. There's more. They had to stop. One time Moses had to stop the people and say, that's it, that's enough. Uh, don't, don't bring any more. There's more than enough. Imagine having that problem for the kingdom. More than enough to say, guys, we've paid off the debt. We've got more than enough. We want to fix the outside building, you know, the outside of this building. <clears throat> more than enough. Please stop. You're pouring in too much. That's a great problem. But you have to think like that to believe that's possible. But God, it's all about our hearts, if you can hear that. Please hear that. To me, every time we argue, oh, that's on the, on the old covenant. Just start with 10%. Let that be your baseline and do that for the rest of your life and learn to give more. Isn't God worthy? Doesn't He give you everything? Can He trust you with money or are you going to love money? It's a good safeguard so you don't ever love money above anything else and always put His kingdom first. If I had free 
if I had three friends, I'll say this, I usually bring them up here, but if I had Chris, if I had Ethan, I had Terry here, and I'm going to go for a trip, I give them $10,000 each. So look, please, don't, thank you. Terry goes, thanks. And I give them $10,000 a month each, a month. So all I ask of you, take care of that money. You're stewarding my money. It's my money, not yours. But please take care of my wife and my family. I'm going to be away for a year. Can you please take care of them? All I ask you is give them $1,000 a week. I'll give you $10,000 a week even, all right? Give you $10,000. Let's say that. But give my wife $1,000. Then I come back from my long trip a whole year away. I come back and I say, uh, Terry, and I said to my wife, well, how, did, how did they go? Terry, and you know, Terry, all the time, was giving me times. He gave me $1,000 every week and actually above, another $500. Oh, okay, that's great. It's amazing. Chris was also amazing. He was giving um, $1,000 every week. But Ethan, I pick on him because he's my son. Ethan was, he gave $1,000 the first, second week, $1,000. Then he went to $800. Then he went to $500. Then he no longer was giving anymore. I don't know why, but now, do you think me, the person who owns everything, do you think I'm going to give him more money to take care of my, my bride? Why would I trust him with more if he hasn't taken care of the one I've given him? That's what I'm talking about. I believe that's how God looks at our hearts. I'm giving you the blessing. Put my bride first. It is to go to the storehouse. It's for the food in my household. For us to preach this gospel of the kingdom beyond our city and, our, and this nation. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to see the truths that are in your word, Lord, to rightly divide the word of God and not to, through fear or unbelief, misinterpret your word. We submit ourselves to your word. This is a beautiful opportunity to submit ourselves to God's word and God's authority and say, Lord, I'm going to adjust this in my life. I'm going to adjust this in my family. I'm going to adjust this in my budget. And I'm going to bring the first 10% increase in my life to your storehouse where I belong. For the rest of my life, make that decision right now. Just to have the faith to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to put your kingdom first, number one. Because I really believe God is adjusting, laying the right foundation, shifting our hearts so He can trust us with the true riches. So, Father, we thank You. Bless Your people. Prosper them. Pour out Your glory. Pour out true riches, I pray, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Wonderful God. I am finished, but I'm just trying to think, should I share this last? What, what is true riches? It's, it's God's presence. I remember my, my son, Josiah, and Soph, a few years ago, it was about three years ago, so just before this building, we, we had our hands on the building, and I said, Lord, I know this doesn't work this way. But I, I was trying to adjust my heart, make sure my heart's in the right space. I said, Lord, if I, if I had to lose the building and not get it at all, but know for sure that they'll, they'll fall pregnant and have a son, that is true riches. I thought, I'm, I, I'd rather walk through that and lose everything in the natural of this building because we're about to get it. Than if You don't have to make that an exchange. So don't get me wrong. I didn't make an exchange with God. I'm just saying, Lord, I want to make sure I'd rather them fall pregnant and have a precious son that's way more true riches than anything else in this world. That's true riches. God's presence. God's children. God's family. Amen.